Change your camera. No, no, I'm trying to do. Okay. No, it's your own camera. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't change it to. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning, Good morning. Good morning, Vice Chancellor. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Are you? Well, we thank God. I'm going to invite. Um, let's see. I have Dr. Irere Mena, Phyllis uh, Bridget is here. I have uh, Professor Ibino. Uh, could you change your name to yourself, uh, Vice Chancellor, sir? Because I could see myself in so many. <laughs> Can you change the name? Or is this the host? Uh, just identifying my name with uh, the co-host. I believe uh, Professor Olai too. We, we thank God for that. Is it possible that we see the faces of the presenters? Okay. There's someone in a I'm having everyone in my name. What, what's going on? Post LSA. Dr. Bridget, good morning. Maybe we use our we use your login. So I so I will check again. Good morning. Okay, no, my no, name no. is correct. <laughs> your name is correctly projected. Yeah. Yeah. But BC, you can change, you can change your name. You go to participants, identify yourself, and then change. It's, it seems our panel is, uh, or our session rather, is uh, using the same ID. And uh, it's okay, it's okay, it's just that uh, Tijani cannot be all over. So, but so if you are uh, not, Prof. Sir, yes, what sir. I, th I think what has happened is that perhaps you shared your own login details to everybody. Everybody have their own uh, unique login link that they should use. It's in their email. That way we won't have, uh, we won't have this uh, issue. It's not really an issue. Just that uh, there are many followers of Tijari. I think um, the best option in a double quick match is to go to the participants and change names. I think that will solve the yes. problem in a yes. double quick match. Thank yes. you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Mustafa. Yeah. I have done so. I have done so, yeah. Dr. Mustafa has done so. Uh, LSA, apologies. Uh, that is why I was trying to reach uh, Professor Saeed. We don't want you guys to eat into our time. We have a, 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 a lot to do, to learn. Right um, is it possible that we change the names by ourselves? Yes, that's what we are saying. LSA right, conference is good. That's, what I'm, trying, that's is what I'm trying to do now. So whoever is coming in, they should please. Uh, and uh, with the exception of the panelists, is it possible for the host LSA to mute all others, please? Or you make me a co-host and I will start muting because some people are fond of coming in and uh, unfortunately they will not mute and we do not want any distraction. It is 12.47. The number of people present as panelists surpassed the expected panelists. So if we can identify ourselves 
so we can separate panelists from discussants and can put it in proper position. Let's see, it would be hard for us not to acknowledge that, but we also, in effect, encouraging his own people as Western and European supporters that it's not over by any means, and that given time and continued military support, Ukraine will have success going forward. By the way, you mentioned that 16, yeah. uh, as you know, at every juncture, Ukraine is pushing for more and more capable weapons, and the F-16 is certainly among them. Yeah, Jim, thank you for the reporting analysis, as always. Yeah. The, in the program, we have a total of around six panelists or five, but currently we have 15 here. Yeah. People are entering as panelists, Most but they are discussants and they are panelists. So probably we can identify yeah. ourselves so we can yeah. properly distribute each of the members of yeah. this session. Probably. Thank you. We can type our names in the chat box and we will do so. Hello, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can okay, hear you, sir. sir. Please do, do us a favor. We, we have to move on because uh, we, we lost time already. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also live on uh, Facebook uh, uh, for your record, apart from what you're recording. Uh, the panelists are as follows. Professor Abiodun Musa Aibinu, Dr. Felix Bridget, she's the only female, okay? And then Professor Oladi Meji, and then Dr. Efuntade, who is there with you at the venue, is the only one there with you. If you, if a Dr. Pastor Efuntade from Adeleke University could just please rename yourself for identification, and then the, the, the host can go ahead and uh, do whatever they need to do without distracting us because we need to stand in earnest. Is this Pastor Efuntari? There's someone. Can you speak if you are Pastor Efuntari? Pastor Dr. Efuntari? I know he's there at the un uh, University of Lake, he's on, he's on campus. and. Uh, but in any case, mute all orders and uh, we can start. Uh, today is uh, June 22nd. It is past the hour that we're supposed to start. Good afternoon, Nigeria, West Africa, Europe generally. Good afternoon, other parts of the world. But good morning at the neck of my hood, which is North America. Unfortunately, we cannot, some of us cannot be present on ground. I want to thank the panelists for their dedication. Uh, some of them are supposed to be somewhere else, but they chose to be with us and share with us their body of knowledge on the subject. Uh, so today, the session 1J, is uh, titled Decolonizing Tertiary Education Model, Faith, Learning, and Modeling for Citizens. This is about faith and learning. And the panelists that we have will have uh, 12 minutes to speak to us. If you are not a panelist, kindly mute yourself, please. Kindly mute yourself. Kindly mute yourself. Uh, they will speak to us. But let me give the background to, to this important session. Just yesterday, at the convocation lecture at my alma mater, 
Lagos State University, myself and one of the panelists here, Dr. Bibi, happen to be pioneer uh, students uh, at Lasso. Just yesterday, the ES of Ted Fund, architect Sonny Echano, aptly noted that, quote, the global community needs to produce graduates and skilled workers who would be fit for purpose. He hit the nail on the head by talking about the training of men and women of young and old, not just to have credentials, but also to fit global nation. So there is indeed a paradigm shift in tertiary education. But before our time, early tertiary institutions in Europe and North America, for instance, were established on varieties of faith, that is Christian faith. In the Muslim world, tertiary institutions were also established based on the Islamic faith. In the Nigerian context, in the last four decades, we've seen the emergence of tertiary institutions that are predicated on the faith of the founders or the group. I happen to be a pioneer teacher, senior administrator at one of such when I volunteered to return to Nigeria in 2011. And one of the panelists, uh, Dr. Pastor Benga Funtade, is currently the vice president for spiritual lives, as well as a lecturer in the religious department. He will also be speaking to us on this important subject. From my perspective, before I allow the panelists, uh, my colleagues to speak from their perspective, I just want to say that uh, the need for reformation of education and learning, the need to train God-fearing leaders, the need to also build that human capacity that we need locally, nationally, and globally to fit purpose, to borrow the words of uh, architect Sonia Chono yesterday. We never discuss about this, <laughs> but it just fit, you know, it's lecture like just fit into what we are doing today. The quest to train God-fearing leaders to infuse the doctrine of either the Islamic faith or the Christian faith into teaching the content has become so important in the training of this generation Z and the generations to come thereafter. The significance of faith and learning is in its understanding and applying the faith of the institution, the vision and mission and philosophy of the founders, as we often, for instance, in Nigeria, the volume one academic brief you submit as the founder or will be founder of it university will have to explain your vision, your mission, your philosophy. And this is also, you know, uh, the basis of the establishment of several universities in North, uh, North America that I personally have been privileged to work with. In fact, at Baylor University, I remember in 2011, because of the experiences that faith-based institutions in Nigeria gained, I was invited to organize something similar 
at Babcock University. Okay, Babcock University. This was in 2011. And of course, it was through that workshop that I was literally arrested, okay, to return to Nigeria and give up whatever dollar salary that I'm making to at least help. And that is how I ended up at uh, Adelaide University with their own brand of Seventh-day Adventist faith, Christian faith-based institution uh, established by uh, Dr. Adelaide Adeleke. If you don't know him, maybe if I say the father of David Doe, then you probably know him now. So this session is a mix of distinguished scholars, senior administrators, who were not necessarily, necessarily trained at a faith-based tertiary institutions, but are now agents. They are now abingas of infusing and implementing the faith of their employers in marketing, in recruiting, in training and curricular development that does not run foul of the National Universities Commission uh, if we're looking at the borrowing the paradigm of the Nigerian uh, space. They have gained experiences even despite the varieties of Christian and Islamic faith of the institutions. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the following panelists. Uh, we have a vice chancellor with us, Professor Abiodun Musa Aibinu. He is the vice chancellor of Summit University in Ofa, Kwara State. And he will do more introduction when he speaks to his uh, presentation for 12 minutes. We are also a deputy vice chancellor. My brother, Professor Latif Oladimeji. In interestingly, we went to the same secondary school. It was a year ahead of me. I, I hope you are not embarrassed. <laughs> but it's one of those seniors that uh, we were so united and so uh, uh, we, we did the right thing. We also have with us Dr. Mrs. Bridget Phyllis Oturimo. Uh, if I murder your last name, forgive me. But this is my study body when we were pioneer students at Lasso. Dr. Phyllis is with uh, Liberty University. Oh, by the way, Professor Ladimeji is with at IPMA University. Then we also have Dr. Pastor Benga Efuntade, who is the Vice President, Spiritual Life, and uh, Lecturer in the Religious Department at Adelike University. Uh, I believe he's with us, he's there, in, I've not seen his face. Uh, the person I'm seeing in this face that is still with us, uh, relaxing on his comfortable chair, I don't think that is a fantasy. So host, you may want to, I don't know who that is, but uh, you may want to also uh, do the needful. If Dr. Fontade is there in the room we're supposed to use for this session, kindly also projecting uh, us. So in this order, not necessarily in terms of seniority or age, I think I will yield to the Amazon in our midst. Uh, from my neck of the hood, they say ladies first. We want to yield to our mother, our friend, our sister, to share with us in 12 minutes, the Liberty University, Virginia, state of Virginia, contest of faith and learning and creating a global citizen. Uh, could you please unmute uh, Dr. Bridget to speak to our paper? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon in Nigeria. 
It's um, so interesting. It's such an interesting topic. And um, I'm so delighted to be here today. I hope you can see my um, slides. Please confirm if you do have the slides. If yes. You can, thank you so much. Thank you so very much. So um, what are we talking about today? Decolonizing tertiary education model benefits of, I, I added the benefits because that is why we're here today. Just like Prof said, my study buddy forever <laughs> and my mentor, you know, um, it, it, there's, there's, there are great and huge benefits of integrating faith and learning in modeling global citizens. I'm just a simple girl from Nigeria, um, working at Liberty University, privileged to work at university, uh, Liberty University in the International Student Center, because I believe in making meaning to my life, integrating faith in what I do in every aspect of my life has led me to Liberty University and interestingly to the International Student Center. I had the opportunity of an adjunct professor position, but I chose this so that I can make a difference. So whatever we do in life, whether you be a Christian, whether you be a Muslim, it is because you are led to fulfill destiny. And that is so huge in this, in what we're talking about, because the, the society that we are in right now, in if we're gonna model this Gen Z and then Gen Alpha, that they, you know that it's <laughs> they just keep describing themselves in different pronouns. Particularly from Africa, and from all for from over eighty countries and eighty nations of the world. You know, it's very interesting that I see that my life, integrating faith as part of my life has led me thus far to be able to make impact in the lives of the students. So I will not waste your time. Um, I gave it a thematic definition of um, uh, decolonization, free from dominating influence. That's all it is. We want our universities to be free. And like Prof said, it ha we have to identify what the problem is. We have to challenge the status quo. We have to revise, we have to replace those assumptions, those ideas, those values, those practices, you know? And that actually reflects what the colonization or colonizers have that dominate, you know, dominating influence. I chose Merriam-Webster dictionary because that's exactly how I feel about this, about this particular situation. In the educational context, we need to confront, we need to challenge the practices. And I've seen it work in, um, in um, Liberty University. What needs to be decolonized in the, higher, in the higher institutions or higher education? Prof talked about it that higher institutions need to restructure their role within the, you know, um, the, 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 the society, the larger society. Why is this, why is it necessary? Harvard University, um, Yale University, all, a lot of the Ivy Leagues, they all started as Christian schools. They still have their roots in Christian schools, no matter the wokeism all over the place, no matter the, you know, trying to restructure, trying to change, you know, trying to modernize, trying to, you know, with technology and all, it still does not change where you, it's like, even working in America, it does not change the fact that I'm a Nigerian and I'm black, it doesn't change that fact. So it doesn't change the fact that they had their roots in faith, and learning. They started that way. And Christian colleges and universities, they are avenues to accomplish this. They were avenues to colonize as well. And so they are also avenues to decolonize. And research has also shown that educating the entire individual, the whole individual, spiritually, cognitively, socially, emotionally, physically, is what will make the difference. That's how we're going to do it. And um, Asha 2020, uh, 2009 had this to say that the work of um, decolonizing the entire individual 
is not only self-reflective efforts. Through my numbing in the nation, my focus is on the fact that it is a commitment to transform the social being. It is a commitment to transform our educational context, within our educational context. And I look at it from the service learning model, which Liberty University uses very strongly, is the ability for us to be able to reconnect with the community, reconnect with the community to conceptualize knowledge and practice. It's a blend of what you're learning in classroom, how can you apply this within the society to make a difference? How, what is the depth of your knowledge? And do the students have a support system to be able to accomplish this? The University of Victoria went into deep, you know, extensive research and their own model aligns exactly with what Liberty University is also doing. There's an interaction between academic study, practical experience, civic engagement, and then the service learning integrated, integrating these three, because the students have an opportunity to gain this knowledge within the, 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 the traditional classroom with understanding of how to apply it by volunteering their Christian community service with an identified and approved community partner. And they practicalize what they have learned. Sometimes they go on internships and sometimes they go on field works and sometimes they also have the opportunity to go on mission field. The mission trips are also so very interesting because it allows them to indeed integrate their faith with what they have learned and apply it in, this, in improving the society. And that's the way we're gonna develop these global citizens that we're talking about. Leaders that can make a difference. That is always what it is for me. Leaders that can make a difference. What can we do? The integration of faith, which I see as one's personal belief, the philosophy, your relationship with God, through the profess, for me, it is through the profession and the acceptance of the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And that's the, that's the platform on which the Liberty University stands. And the learning process of behaviorism, you know, how you respond to what you have learned, how you respond, how, what change, what change comes out of you. Then, you know, co the cognitive, what, how do you retain? How do you restore? How do you retrieve this knowledge that you have? How do you retain it? And how do you apply it? You know, and research also says that it is through service learning. Service learning, according to B. Jacoby, is in the higher, in the higher, in higher education is a form of experiential education in which students engage in activities that address human and community needs. If it's not addressing human beings, if it's not addressing how it can make human beings better, if it's not addressing how you can help the people around you, if it's not addressing how you can make an impact in your society, in your community, it's not worth learning. It's just a waste of time. So we see within the Liberty University, students going for law, and then going for evangelism. They, so they have a dual uh, uh, um, 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 academic pursuit. They're studying law to be lawyers, but they're also studying how they can use law to be an evangelist within, the, you know, when they go out there, when they graduate. So you see the benefits of service learning according to research that there's a connection between theory and practice. If one, effective student learning outcomes, critical thinking skills, students develop empathy. There's, they, they, there's a development of both within themselves and their interaction with other people. They can accept their failures. They can accept their pains. They can accept the challenge that comes against them when they tend to stand for what they believe in because that's what we want, that's what we want. We want global citizens who can stand for what they believe in, who can stand for the truth and the, you know, how to defend their faith and what they believe in in their profession and what they've learned. And then intrinsic, there's also cross-cultural awareness. I teach, a, I, teach a, I, I teach in a workshop that um, some fellows within a division must take and some international students because what is service learning? You learn how to interact with other cultures. I organize over 14, sometimes 27, depending on the semester, 
sometimes 27 workshops and for federal regulations, you know, helping them. To, and then they will also have 12 definite, distinct cultural, historical and cultural events where the domestic students and the international students come together to learn about their cultures. What do they value? What makes them the people that they are? from different cultures and they begin to appreciate and learn how to intentionally communicate with one another the best possible way that they can. The Liberty model, I love Liberty. Liberty is not just a beautiful school, but it has, it is well equipped. Liberty is well equipped. And what is it all about? What's their philosophy? Their philosophy is one, put God first. Once you're able to recognize the fact that you can put God first by accepting the fact that God exists and his authority. And funny enough, because of the conservativeness of Liberty University, we have Muslims coming to study in Liberty University. We have atheists coming to study in Liberty University. Trust me, not all pastors' children believe in God. They, challenge, they have their challenges, but when they come, they meet a different, they, they, it's not just, they're not just confined within the classroom. They are challenged to put into practice what they are learning. They are, their faith is really challenged. Some of them begin to like, begin to say to themselves, now I understand what my father is, all, you know, talks all about in church. I never used to see because I was so confined, but now I understand it, relating it with life, real life experiences. Now I understand it. Then they are able to embrace the Christian and the biblical worldview, which research also has dealt very much into. So we have a sanctuary at Liberty University. This is our philosophy of education. We have a sanctuary where the students have the opportunity. They are not forced, they are not compelled, but they, they have the opportunity there to attend the services. And then we have this vine center, this beautiful vine center here. This is, it's compulsory. This one, we have over 80 speakers every semester from different walks of life, music, legal, medical, business, economics, politicians coming in every Wednesday and Friday where they meet with the students and they share their stories, they share their pain, they share their shame, they share their successes to prove to students that in real life, you can make a difference. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you think you are going through, because sometimes Gen Alpha especially think that the whole world is against them. But <laughs> when they see what people, real people in real life challenges, not protected, not shielded, but knowing that because of their faith, they are able to accomplish what they've accomplished and they've been able to make a difference. Then they have an example to learn from. They have an example to hold their to. And then yeah. you have- I'll give you one more minute. How many I, minutes? I'm giving you just one extra minute. Okay, so one we minute. have- so our can, mission is to raise champions. Some of this stuff later. Oh, okay. Our mission is to have is to raise champions, and um, a lot of what we do is making sure that students, you know, have the best experiences, best everything that can help them, you know, their spirit, soul, and their body. Facilities. We have a robotic library. We have the best athletic centers. Even the you know factual things and of course a vibrant international student center that I work in, Liberty University offers students a selection from six seven learning models: the service learning course components, the service learning course, the service learning capstone course, the service learning um, internship, and the service learning domestic and international service and community based research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my dear study body. Uh, you've done well. Uh, Lasso, as the you for the convocation, we'll be so proud of you and I and so many others uh, globally. 
Uh, at this point, I would like to call on our vice chancellor, uh, the vice chancellor of Summit University of uh, Kwara State, a scientist, uh, Professor Abiodun Musa Aibinu. Our brother, you have 12 minutes also, sir. You can unmute. The host kindly unmute, Professor Abiodun. LSA host Thanks a lot for, yeah, I'm here now. So just let me quickly share my slide and thanks a lot for that invitation. And let me also thank uh, our last speaker for that wonderful experience. I've taken note. And let me also assure you that uh, most of my colleagues in the university, they are here with us listening to you. So I hope you can see my screen from that side. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so I will be talking about decolonizing tertiary education. Just and let me put it that I'm in total agreement with what the last speaker mentioned. But just to add more to it and to share my own experience from the side of Summit University of uh, Again, I'm Abiodun Musa Ibinu. I'm the vice chancellor of the university. And you have my contact there. Should, should you want to get across to me after this talk? Basically, on my own, this is what I do mechatronics engineering, academic which is just academic but at law of entrepreneurship, and then we have the artificial intelligence. But today, I will be talking from the area of what they call spiritual intelligence. This is a mixture of, of, of religion, spiritual, and the technology, but different from what we, we have learned and learned. And that's why we are going to be looking at decolonization, decolonizing the education. So, but before going further, let me share with us what we stand for. And that's exactly what the moderator said some minutes ago, that we must be looking at producing different type of graduates. And that's what we do at Summit. Number one, number one, the skills, teaching, internalization, funding, and less. But today, we are going to be talking about global citizenship. Do we see that under consideration and less? And as the moderator mentioned, as I was there, at Summit University, we focus on skills, and we call it 21st century. And, and those skills are for us to achieve what is called industry fitted graduates. Industry fitted graduates. That is, you don't have to teach them your job unless after employing them. Nowadays, we have graduate internship uh, uh, set up by various organizations just to bridge that gap in the skills, in the knowledge of, of newly, newly employed graduates. So, the colonized education uh, uh, and they provided an standard to what is called CCM score curriculum minimum academic standard. It's a typical work pattern under the supervision of NUC to do more or less decolonizing. And then it has to do with educators, policymakers, students, and the community. The importance of it is so much. The first is equity and inclusivity because it will address our historical and systemic biases. Why do you have to teach me about some European explorers when I'm yet to know about our local explorers in Nigeria? 
all of us learn about them, but only if you learn about Ajala travel, Ajala all over the world. So why must I learn about them? And then challenge him in your Eurocentricism. Why do you have to tell me about someone living in short to discover us when that person actually asks for the route to get to where he was going? And then Yoruba will say, in Tomoto, in Baba one day, in one of his poor blessings, in, in so he told us, and he challenged that to school. What we, what we are. So, and then uh, that also leads to what is called imposition of curriculum. But the curriculum we are trying to change now under the system has developed by us, jointly developed by the academia, the industry, and the community, and the student. But the role of faith in decolonizing education, number one, foundational values and worldview. That's part of what we, we are presently doing. And that's what spiritual intelligence is all about. That is, how do we use everyday knowledge? Uh, how do we use AI and the rest to solve everyday problem? And the moral and ethical education, the last speaker mentioned this also. And the transmission of religious knowledge and tradition. When you look at us in Africa, you at every particular point in time, we believe in something superior than our knowledge. So no way, no, no how we normally allocate something as something that is much powerful by you, than you and me. So we need to put that one into the context of our education. And then I, another belief, community and character. Uh, so let's now quickly look at Summit University faith based approach. Let me just quickly summarize that Summit University is a university owned by a faith based institution, which is Ansar Udin Society of Nigeria. And we operate on three projects knowledge, skills, and moral. When you look at it, knowledge, and you talk about skills. Nowadays, everybody is talking about skills and then morals, which must be from the faith. So uh, that's why at Summit University, we have introduced several skills. And I want us to pay attention to the last one. The first one is financial literacy. Everybody must be financially literate now. Clean and renewable energy. In Nigeria, we are energy deficient country. That is energy poverty is very high in Nigeria. We are not talking only about financial poverty, energy poverty. Family and leadership, artificial intelligence and ICT, academic that is how we turn Anything academic, how we turn it into what? In, into business and startup. But look at the last two. We have specifically introduced that because of the colonization. Number one, history, heritage, and storytelling. We must be able to tell our story and we must be, we must understand our history and value our heritage. And the last one, the last skill is what they call Islam and global citizenship skill. We now talk about. I can be sitting down in Nigeria and be working in America, take my breakfast and then I go to America, work and come back for lunch. So it is about integration of faith and knowledge and the moral and character development and the job creation and entrepreneurship and the cultural preservation. Those are some of those things we have put in there. So what are the key components of the decolonization model we are looking at? Number one, curriculum transformation. We cannot continue to teach our children, our students today, the way we were taught yesterday. The way we were taught yesterday was for us to sustain the colonization model, just to keep it working, not to stop. But if you continue to teach like that, then we are not preparing our students for tomorrow. So the curriculum with the with NUC leading CCMAS is actually doing that. And then inclusion of marginalized voices. Uh, just about a few months ago, we, we, we won a grant funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the title of the grant is Artificial Intelligence for Female in STEM. And then, but the area I want to look, I want us to look at is the for us to have an idea that we want to set up artificial intelligence, female-centered artificial intelligence lab, just 
by inclusion of where they can share, they can feel more relaxed, it's about our uh, inclusion of these marginalized work and cultural preservation. About a few weeks ago, or we will be commissioning uh, what is called a South Indian History Museum and offer history museum on our campus because we must preserve our culture and the university is the best place to do that. And the community and uh, we also use what you call quadruple elix in our operation, quadruple elix, the university, government, industry, and the community. And we have been engaging the community in, in this decolonization. So what have we been doing? And now I think they are achieving this workshop and seminars. A lot of workshop on drone training, piloting, clean energy, and why? Knowledge, economy, this time. And then collaborative development under the CCMAS, research funding and grants. And that's what we champion grantmanship. Grantmanship has helped us also to, to decolonize what we are, what we, we have in Asia. So because with grants and rest, you will be able to study, maybe to be able to find answers to those things. And that's why. Student support and engagement is, is key to us at Summit University. That's why we operate, to, as the last speaker also mentioned, student-centered approach, where they have a voice, where we look at the web in any time, anywhere, and then mentor and guide them. Uh, I mentioned the Academy of Engineering for the grant. We have mentoring scheme under that, and, we, and that's another way you can remove people, you can decolonize education. And a lot of initiatives from the students is about democratization of teaching and democratization of learning. That is, let the student teach them self and their holistic support services. That's part of what we are also offering as part of decolonization model with feedback and evaluation. So what have been the achievements so you far? Been, uh, and you see, I'll give you one more minute. Yes, I will quickly round up in the next one minute. So this has been some of our achievements. And then about a few weeks ago, and we we had graduates from the community. And then at of now, we are we can pride ourselves as the center of PCB, printed circuit board in Nigeria. Do you need any printed circuit board? It's a joint venture between one innovation hub of uh, Mumas Engineering and, and Summit. <laughs> University. Conclusion, or in concluding, decolonizing tertiary education involves challenging the colonial in Bible infused system. And then, but at Summit University, we are trying to integrate faith, knowledge, space, and moral together so that we can align with broader decolonization effort and achieve global citizenship. It is on this note I say. If we, if if it doesn't matter how many resources we have in Nigeria, in the world, if we don't know how to use them, those resources will never be enough. It is time for us to decolonize totally our mentality, our knowledge, our faith, and our skill. Thank you for listening, and thank you for this opportunity to share my little knowledge and experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, we're all clapping. They clapping on Facebook. I think the total attendance thus far, virtually, is uh, almost a uh, hundred. Uh, we have folks on the live Facebook that I'm zooming. We have uh, folks joining us at Unilag. We have. Uh, at the command of the vice chancellor on summit ground <laughs> offer almost everybody. I don't know the population of students and the faculty there. They are there by fire by force. Okay. And of course, at Al Ikma, we have uh, the DVC uh, and the uh, also, you know, calling his own troop. Uh, the organizer, the LSA, could you please check whether Dr. Funtade, being a Funtade is uh, in the room where we're supposed to be having this seminar. Can you unmute and answer that question? No, he's not, sir. Uh, because he's been there since yesterday. Is there anyone, is there a way you can check that particular room where we are scheduled to meet physically? 
This is the room uh, where uh, everyone is scheduled to meet physically, but Mr. Benga is not here. Uh, Dr. Benga, sorry, is not here. Hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll continue. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Latif Oladimeji from Al Ikma University, and uh, he will speak to us from the realm of uh, Al Ikma uh, and how faith and learning is occurring. At the end of the day, we will take questions. So please, if you have uh, identified people on ground uh, that would like to ask questions, I need you to do that for us uh, on ground at the University of Lagos. And then those online, virtual, please uh, do use the Q&A or the chat, uh, whichever one you are able to access to ask your question, because we will take questions before we round up uh, this uh, uh, first level of presentation. Thank you. Professor Ladi Meiji. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator and members of the panel, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see that this is a privilege, a real privilege for that matter, to be here. I am uh, Latif Folon Shola Dimiji, and uh, like I've been introduced before, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor at Hikma University. But apart from that, uh, also a stakeholder as far as the Hikma University is concerned. I am the secretary to the Board of Trustees of the university. The idea that came together to bring what we now have as a Hikma University in place. <clears throat> Let me begin on the note of apology that I won't be able to share slides. Actually, I'm on transit now. And in the next few hours, I'll be you know, going on a you know, uh, hajj. We will be spending several hours on air. So I'm even lucky that this program is coming up before I actually go and start boarding for the hajj. I'm so happy about it, but unfortunately, I couldn't, I would not be able to share my slides with you. I'm sorry about this. Uh, however, I will speak to my uh, paper, Decolonization of Education, the Islamic uh, Perspectives. That is the way I've viewed it. And um, I want to begin by saying that I stand to concur with the two previous speakers, uh, my dear sister and my brother, Professor Ayodo, my, my Bino, who have spoken before my presentation. This is because the issue of decolonization is a phenomenon that everybody in the realm of education will agree that is the end thing. So this theme is coming at the very appropriate time and my institution at Al Hikma University is very much keen about it. Now, let me begin by saying that decolonization has been well defined and given various samples. But the only word I just want to add there is the fact that colonization itself may not be a crime. It was a concept that was brought in at a point in time to attend to some issues. Now to decolonize is to ensure that the right thing at the right time for the right people is done. And that is what this theme is uh, talking about. Al Hikma University joined the League of Proposed University in the 1990s when the gate, the door of a privatization of education in Nigeria was flung open under President Ulishe Gobasan Job. But before then, there has been an institution, a College of Higher Islamic Studies, which serves as a kind of the you know, diploma program under the Abraham Oladimeji College of Islamic Sciences. The intention at that time was to produce diploma students who will go and further their studies and complete a university education. So we're sending them to Chad Republic, to Benin Republic, to some other African countries. But when this idea came up and the federal government of Nigeria opened the door for privatization, we felt, why can't we metamorphose from this college to a university? And that was exactly how we started the idea. The Al Hikma project started with the philosophy of Al Azhar University in Cairo. 
you will agree with me that Azar University in Cairo started in a mosque. It was a mosque project. And today it has become a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, the history of university in the world is never complete without the mentioning of Azahar University in Cairo. So we try to tailor our principle along this line. Also, based on the principles of Islam that says that knowledge is a lost item for Muslims. Pick it wherever you find it. And so we use the model of the mosque. Today, when you get to Al Hikma University, you realize that the central project, the central uh, uh, structure is the mosque. So the milling in and out of students' activities revolves around the mosque. And I will explain further how the mosque has become that major agent of decolonization for us in Al Hikma University. We began with the idea of looking at what education is in Nigeria and what it ought to be and how we could address and provide our own platform using the Islamic basis. I want to refer us to Quran chapter 18, Surah to Kaf, where Allah was talking about the youth. These youth were within a particular system. They didn't like the system they were, but they had no choice. But at a point in time, they had to seclude themselves away from the majority of issues. In other words, they, 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 they disagreed with the idea or the slogan of if you can't beat them, join them. Rather than joining them, they went and isolated themselves. And for a long time, Almighty Allah protected them from the misbehaviors of the society. And after many, many years, many, many years, according to the Quran, Allah retained them and they were still alive. And they were able to uh, alienate themselves from the rotting of the society they found themselves. We therefore felt that there's a need for us to create an environment for students who will be in the Nigerian society, but who can actually raise their heads after having gone through what we refer to as our own al hikma project. So in the 1990s, we started with the, the academic brief of the university. As I did mention, we had a college in existence. So we now advance those ideas in the college to the university system. And I happens to be the, the link between the committee and the National Universities Commission. So we tailored our academic brief in line with the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Muhammad and the injunctions of the Holy Quran that says that a complete human being is what is worthy of any learning because you just don't learn and take a certificate. We realize that in Nigeria today, certification is the in thing. And so we started with our academic brief. And fortunately, the NUC saw sense in what we were planning and they were, they were going along with us. In 2005, January, we got the license to operate as a university. I won't be able to delve much more on the curriculum, but I must say here that the curriculum is tailored towards Islamic principles and the amalgamation of what we have on ground and how we can improve on it and create a kind of uh, uh, suitable environment for Muslim students. So how do we go about that? We started with our logo. Our logo, learning for wisdom and morality. Learning for wisdom and morality. Number two is that we see the situation in schools as very, very precarious. The teachers themselves, who are to teach and impact the knowledge on others, they are very rotten. So what Alikma did is to ensure that we work on those who will impact knowledge on our children. The teacher themselves were, first of all, the ones that were trained that you must go through a Likma training before you can be a lecturer in a Hekma University. Because what you don't have, of course, you cannot give. 
And so, based on that, the teacher themselves must be well equipped and well prepared. So, that was our first assignment. After having gone through that, we now have to start our recruitment, our admission process, which says that we do not discriminate between Muslims and non Muslims. Today, we have a sizable percentage of non Muslims in our Hekma University. In fact, some pastors who have attended and served this college in their own days saw Al Hikma University as the way out for them because they were never coerced. They were never hypnotized when they were in Nazaruddin College and Nazaruddin you know, Secondary School and so on and so forth. So they saw Al Hikma University in that particular life. So they were bringing their children to us. Secondly is the fact that we cannot be talking of decolonization when indeed the appearance of the student themselves is depicting a colonized society. So we felt we need an ideal Islamic appearance for our students. So we promoted the culture of hijab, not just a cape hijab, full hijab. So that today, one Ngozi, one Amaka, who is a student of Alikma University is in full hijab because she knows that that is the culture there. And our thinking is that when you talk about sexual harassment, Sex, sexual abuse and so on and so forth. It starts from the way you appear even before your lecturers. So you need to dress the way you want to be addressed. So Alikma culture is that of full hijab for our ladies and a well cultured dressing for the boys. You must either appear in Nigerian dress, a formal dress, if you are putting on a shirt, there must be tie to match. If you are dressing in the kaftan, there must be a cap along with it. So you don't just dress, dress haphazardly. You are conscious. That consciousness actually drives our philosophy at al Hikma University. Furthermore, we now realize that there is a need for us to have infrastructures in place that will actually assist us to get this thing properly in, 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 in integrated. The aims and objectives of the university of the founder himself, the founder of al Hikma University, a philanthropist, who before the birth of Alikma University has always been donating and building structures and also have a regular bursary awards for indigenous students. So therefore, his drive and aims and objective at Alikma University is to further that charitable uh, gesture that he has always been used to. Go to University of Illinois, you see a lot of structures he has built them for them go to the medical school at the University of Illinois, University of Illinois, University of Illinois Teaching Hospital, you see structure built by Chief Abraham Oladimiji, the hostels for the nurses and so on. So he has always been doing that, even before the birth of Alikma University. Therefore, the aim of Alikma University is to give access to students who are brilliant, but who have one way or the other, some kind of uh, challenges. And so, we have a robust scholarship awards for indigenous students. Now, that started moving in, and by January 5, 2005, when we received our 010 certificate from National Investors Commission, we went straight into action. We started with 70 students, and it's continued to move. We have faces the first five years, the second five years, the third five years. We are now in the fourth, fifth year of our thesis. We had structures on ground. Our curriculum, as well as what we refer to as our academic brief, which metamorphosed into our own academic program. In addition to that, we have the university law, where we stated clearly our vision of having children based on the principles of Islam, who will grow out and after graduation, they will be able to learn and impart the knowledge of Islam and academics to others. In, in doing that, we also have our, strat our strategic plan, which was properly articulated. And the strategic plan today has actually been able to guide us in our affairs. Then we have the staff condition of service, which provided a kind of forum for our our, our staff to come to Alikma University and to be part of the move. Therefore, today, what Alikma University has been able to do is to look at 
how best to decolonize education. One, our curriculum, which is based on Islam, including our GNS courses. At the GNS courses, we told the National Universities Commission that we are including courses in Islamic studies, so basic knowledge of Islam, so that every child that comes to Aligma University has some element of Islam along with whatever certificate he or she wants to acquire. The second one is the Arabic language, an international language that we feel students can learn and they'll be able to even work in some African countries today who are literate in Arabic and who, who are desirous of having people who are fluent in Arabic along with the English language. So we have carried this along with us and we are trying to use that to decolonize education at Al Hikma University. One minute, sir. I must round up by saying that this philosophy of Al Hikma University has been able to push us into producing today over 200 first class students. By December this year, we shall be having our 12th convocation ceremony. And today, with seven faculties, including the postgraduate school, our basic medical sciences is on course, and we're starting the MBBS program very soon. All these are going to be based on learning for wisdom and morality. I want to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Oladimeji, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Al Ikman University. We have listened to uh, three of our panelists, Dr. Pastor Efuntade should be at the venue by now. Uh, I've been chatting with him and he said he, is, uh, he has two minutes, but before his arrival, I think we will go to the Q&A and uh, as soon as he signified that he's there, we will give him uh, perhaps 10 minutes to, to speak to us. And please, the organizers kindly alert us if you see Pastor Efuntade. You cannot miss him because he's above six feet. Okay. Do let me know, sir, when he gets here. Yes, he's, he's above six feet and uh, he has more gray hair than uh, me right now. But he will tell you our relationship. And we've listened uh, to all the panelists from spirit, uh, spiritual, soul, and body. From Dr. Bridges, your intelligence by Professor Ibino, to access to all irrespective of faith by Professor Oladi Meji. One thing Professor Oladi Meji, uh, maybe because of time, maybe you can shed more light on that, when you say access to all irrespective of faith, is the infusion of faith uh, into the study of agriculture and agricultural engineering that I witnessed as a lead uh, of NUC accreditation I believe it was your first accreditation uh, at uh, Al Ikma. Uh, then I was in Nigeria as uh, I believe I finished my time as a DVC at Adeleke, or maybe I was still serving. Uh, but in any case, I led an AUC, and I was shocked that even the founder does not have. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you say it's not a letter, but it's lettered. Okay, okay, Pastor Funtadi is there now. Uh, it's lettered. But he does one thing in the agriculture uh, forum. Pastor Funadi, don't worry, I'll call you uh, shortly. I'll call you. Uh, that is giving, I believe, three or four years to students free. Yes. Free. He told us this story, and I said, wow, this is indeed a revolution, a decolonizing revolution in itself irrespective of your faith, if you choose to study agricultural science or agricultural engineering, and they live on that farm. Yes. I, I couldn't believe it. But you will shed more light on that. Okay, I will do that. So Bridget will shed more light on this spirit, soul, and body. Uh, you, I will give you more time to shed more light. And uh, the same thing with uh, Professor Ibino, spiritual intelligence. Uh, I'm fascinated. And uh, you know, I've been seeing so many things you've been doing uh, 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 with all this science, your background in science, yet you are a champion of H-STEM. 
In other words, humanity and STEM, which I have always been preaching, that the STEM cannot survive without the humanities. And then look at the way you're weaving all the story, the narratives of knowing us, okay? Ajala travel that metamorphose into Andrew Checkout. You're looking at migration issue also. How do we teach it? Both formally and informally. Then you go to Japa and Japada and then Jalo. The varieties of this is very, very important. At this point, I'm going to call on my own dear brother also. And one of the pioneer staff of Adelaide University in Ede, uh, currently the vice president of spiritual life and uh, a teacher, of course, at the Adelaide University, Dr. Pastor Benga Efuntadi, the tallest man. He remained the tallest man at Adelaide University. And I told them when you were coming in that once they see the tallest person entering, with some white beard, more than mine, uh, that is him. And I think they did recognize you and gave you the seat. Manage the, the plastic chair. I, I remember those plastic chairs when you teach spiritual life to those pioneering students. Some of them are now PhD orders. Some of them are, you know, you've transformed. So please speak to us about the Adelike University model that you, so much pioneer and you are still at the forefront of that faith and learning. Uh, you have 12 minutes. We can still accommodate 12 minutes for you because we are supposed to close this show at uh, 2.45. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, LSA host. No, sir, 2.15. Okay, 2.15, okay. Uh, Dr. Funtadi, please, let's do, let's do 12 minutes. You have the the floor, sir. Can you unmute him? Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Tijani. It's nice to see you here again. Um, I thought I'll be able to see you live here in Lagos, but it, it's okay. Technology makes things um, easy and we can have this conversation. Um, this is a, a very, very interesting you know, topic, especially speaking from the perspective of faith. If you're talking about decolonization, um, one of the things that will concern um, anyone is, uh, well, maybe Christianity itself oh, and all sorry, the foreign... If, sorry, sorry, Doc. If you have a PowerPoint, you can share. If not, continue to rock. Okay, so uh, I can have it for now, but it will be able to uh, flow. Um, Christianity itself is part of the heritage that we have, you know, from the Western world. So um, some people have the opinion that Christianity itself is part of the old baggage that's supposed to be um, offloaded from the system or, or you know, uh, foreign religions. Incidentally, uh, the Nigerian community have embraced more foreign religions than the traditional religion. Uh, people may even feel inferior or feel somehow uh, professing uh, the local African traditional religion. And uh, maybe that has its own, uh, its own implications. But when we look at the whole idea of decolonization. It's about addressing injustice, you know, uh, pretty much um, it's a, uh, injustice in the system, especially in terms of power structure uh, of people on one side who are the oppressor, um, who happen to be the colonial uh, leaders and the oppressed, the weaker people. And um, through that, they have been alienated disenfranchised, you know, limited, and there have been agitations to, to correct that. Um, incidentally, I'm speaking from a faith-based, like Professor Tijani said, uh, from a faith-based institution perspective. And um, I see it in a, a different way, in a way that broadens the conversation, that the essence of decolonization is entrenching justice, is seeking uh, fairness to the end that the community can flourish and have access, access to power, access to knowledge, access to resources, um, and they will not be, uh, or the extent of marginalization, marginalization will be lessened to a great extent. So when I speak from a Christian uh, point of view, 
I want to speak not just from a religious point of view, but from the spiritual point of view. There's controversy about the difference between spirituality and religiosity. Um, and I want to um, highlight that difference in terms of not just uh, the motions of religious beliefs, but the functional dimension of religion. And when we look at Christianity, we see that Christianity has pragmatic you know, functional role that it plays in our community uh, to the point that uh, referring to Jesus Christ's ethics of love, agape in the Greek, uh, which is a kind of selfless love that can be embraced, that is empowering. And that agape, the selfless love, is a, a springboard for justice, actually. You know, uh, it's a springboard for fairness. You know, uh, Jesus Christ went on to say, love your neighbor as yourself. So there is no room for, uh, for power display, for oppression, and anything that they can look at it like it in, in, in Christianity. So in, you made reference specifically to Adelike University. You know, um, it's a faith-based university with the philosophy of a total man education, a total person, a total human being, not only educating the mind, which in the traditional setting, education setting in Nigeria, that is the direction. You just come here and then it's more of intellectual engagement. But to notice and to see that human beings are not uh, uh, dimensional, we are multidimensional. And if one aspect of human life is developed and the other part is not developed, then the, the human being is not uh, really feel, uh, fit, especially when we are talking in the light of the global space. We are talking about the global citizenship. You know, of course, we know all the debate about citizenship. Uh, there's a particular framework that um, gives certain rights to certain individuals because they belong to a particular geographical locations, you know, backed by law. So uh, in, in, in theory, that is, that is um, in practice of it, there is nothing as much as um, that can be called global citizenship uh, because it means that you are not rooted in any particular location or you are not delineated. You know, but a whole lot of things have been happening. And Professor Tijani talked about uh, Jaguar syndrome, Jaguar, Jaguar, Jalo, you know, migration and migration challenges, you know, uh, uh, voluntary migrations, uh, migrations caused by wars, by uh, uh, internet displacement, and all the rest. And, you know, the phenomenon of globaliz uh, globalization has made the world a, a global village. We are connected, you know, uh, beyond what we want to accept and beyond what's on you know, um, national laws can actually accommodate, you know. So nations have to prepare their citizens, you know, their citizens for the challenge of the emerging world, you know, uh, for the challenge of a connected world, interconnected, interdependent world, you know. And um, part of the decolonization is preparing people to be able, providing education for people to be able to function in the global, global space. And that is one of the things faith-based education you know, is supposed to do. Uh, because for example, in Nigerian context, you, one of our problems is the problem of corruption and all of that. People are skilled. People come out of universities with first class, with all kinds of certifications and qualifications that give them you know, competencies in terms of professionality, in terms of intellectualism. But we have this deficit of morality in which the uh, uh, faith-based uh, you know, kind of concept is supposed to address. That is the value that's supposed to address. In Adelike University, um, uh, as uh, Professor Jenny said, you know, uh, part of what is done is that built in the curriculum uh, are courses that engender that. Uh, I teach one of them, which is uh, called God a Modern Society. And it's a kind of a comparative religion kind of uh, uh, course but it is taken, that course is taken, you know, we, we address about five uh, religions and talk about their beliefs, their teachings, you know, speaking as a, an insider of that religion, not speaking from uh, another, on the standpoint of another religion, analyzing another religion, okay? So that we can see the empowerment because the particular Nigerian can identify as, you know, with, as either a Christian or as a Muslim, but there's power in that, that we are not allowed to transform you know, our society. And that is, that is one thing that um, we need to do. So decolonization in the curriculum um, includes 
education that will prepare people for a highly diversified world because the globalization has made us to come together. People with different orientation, with different religions, you know, um, we need to come together and we need to be empowered to be able to um, handle our diversity, you know, diversity. You know, we need to move from diversity to pluralism in which people of other uh, worldview can flourish, can prosper, you know, a, the, the leg out of the neck or the knee out of the neck kind of, you know, um, situation so that they can function very well. People who are narcissistic in their view, people who are narrow, um, hardliners, fanatical in their views are going to be creating problem in the global space and they will not be able to function and um, produce optimally. Now, be, uh, beyond religion itself, you know, the, the, I, I believe that Christianity speaks to the uh, idea of uh, decolonization, uh, like I said earlier on, because it, it addresses the power structure. And I also, say, I also think seriously that um, one of the values that should bring is the leadership structure uh, in our uh, institutions, even in terms of curriculum development and academic activities. Because you know the ideal of the NUC is that there will be a kind of bottom-up you know uh, approach in how we develop you know curriculum, what you know subjects must be done, and all of that. But at the end of the day, in practice, it is still top bottom. The management of the university, you know, maybe because of the traditions inherited from the colonial you know structure uh, of the education system, certain courses have to be floated. Uh, certain courses are denied because NUC says that there's no benchmark for them. Therefore, what is really, really available is what has been made available from the top that is forced to the bottom. And I think that area needs to be addressed. Let me wrap this up with the issue of language. You know, we are talking about religion and culture and identity as, as people. One of the things that has alienated us as a people from the global space is the difficulty of language. In Nigeria, if you do not speak English, if you do not know English, if you cannot pass quali qualifying exams in English, regardless of your native intelligence, regardless of your potential, there are so many engineers, so many doctors, so many scientists who are there, who are not able to actualize their dreams because they did not you know, pass English. As a, as a subject, which is one of the requirements of NUC. Well, I do not want to underplay uh, the importance of English is a global language and all of that. But in learning, you know, in, in, in learning, you know, using myself as an example, you know, growing up in an environment, my parents were educated, but we spoke Yoruba in the family. So uh, what that means, or what that meant to me that time was that I had to, first of all, interpret what I was studying, trust in Yoruba. So that layer, you know, of timing, of interpretation is a disadvantage to, to, uh, to an African boy. And not everybody will be able to pick up, you know, to be able to learn. And then they'll be cut off, alienated, disenfranchised, and their potential, you know, to become world-class engineers is denied just because of language issue. If we follow the principle of the Christ, you know, uh, the principle of love, of justice, of inclusivity, then uh, we should remove all the red tapes and all the obstacles in the path to learning and to becoming and to realize our potential. And language is um, is one of them. I think for now, I think I, I, I'll, I'll pause for now. I don't know, I'm not telling myself, but thank I think you I'll be very that much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this brilliant uh, presentation, despite all the traffic in Lagos, uh, you still made it because you are fit and uh, you uh, just fantastic. Agape law, diversity uh, to pluralism uh, is important in our interrogation of faith and learning. Also at Adelike University, the infusion of the Seventh-day Adventists across contents is also important. These are some of the things that others have said before you came in. Either we're talking about summit, we're talking about Al Ikima or Liberty University in Virginia. Uh, I am looking at questions both on the LSA platform online, this Zoom, 
meeting as well as uh, on Facebook. Like I said, you know, I'm, I'm actually also broadcasting live on my Facebook uh, store. Uh, once I see one, then I will give the floor. LSA organizers in the room, do we have questions or comments? Let's take that before I post one for all panelists to, to, to speak to, and then we'll yeah, wrap up. Okay, let's listen to the question or comment. By the way, as we wait, all the panelists, please know that we will either do a book volume edited or a specialized journal uh, uh, article. I was not thinking about this, was listening to the varieties and interesting informative. I said, wow. In fact, if we open it up, we are likely to have volume one and two, you know, books in this direction because we are just, you know, in a little of this. We also listen to students that have been through this system and what is their experience? Uh, have they really been made a global citizen? Are they really better off? So the floor is yours, LSA, whoever wants to ask the question. Introduce yourself, your name, institution, and then uh, ask your question or your comment. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, Chair, and everyone in the room. My name is Nikia Labi. I work here at the University of Lagos. I'm a librarian. Yeah, my question goes to Professor Albino. I think I'm right. Yeah, during your presentation, you, you said a lot of uh, new things that are new to me. I heard from you for the first time, spiritual intelligence. Academic and I'm quite fascinated about those constructs. So you did say that one of the importance of decolonizing education is to ensure diversity, equity, inclusion, and I want to believe um, well, equity, diversity, and inclusion. That is what is trending now in the global space, ensuring that nobody is left out, even including people who have disabilities. Now, with the introduction of the CCMAS, because we also talked about the CCMAS, which uh, AUC has just proposed, and they are saying that universities will own 30% of the curriculum. My question now is, now that we have this opportunity, and before this house is the idea that we need to decolonize uh, higher education in Nigeria. How do you think uh, university administrators, especially our curriculum designers, should make use of this opportunity to ensure that we end up uh, decolonizing uh, higher education? Uh, the prof here, uh, sorry, the pastor here made an important point that when we were growing up, we, we, we were speaking a local di dialect at all, but that is not what we are seeing today. So I just want to learn from you. I want you to address this question. How can we, can universities actually own the CCMAS and ensure that 30% of the courses they are going to introduce will ensure equity, diversity, and inclusion for their students? Thank you. Thank Thanks you a lot for asking that question. And um, can I take permission from the from the more later additional two minutes, let me quickly tell us what spiritual intelligence is all about. Right. And then, right. okay, fine. Spiritual intelligence is very simple. And I love the last speaker when he tried to differentiate religiosity from spirituality. So let's look at the evolution of intelligence in man. The first one we normally see is what we call PQ, the physical quotient. That's when you and me they took our first step and we tried to balance. Mommy and daddy will be so happy with us. They will say, oh, my thing. Then we now enter the era that we start to learn mathematics, arithmetic, and learn. And everything was about IQ. Ah, oh, my God. Then <laughs> that was when we were in primary and secondary school and university. Immediately we graduate, we start working and we start talking about EQ. 
emotional quotient, mm -hmm. emotional intelligence, because how you manage people. But don't forget, at the age after you, after the age of forty, that you have passed through the midlife crisis, then you now need what is called esky, spiritual quotient. That's when mommy, daddy, they continue to fish your insurance, pray in mosque and dress. At that stage, it's no, it's no longer about your intelligent quotient. It's about inner wisdom, guidance, compassion, and the rest. So, what is spiritual intelligence? Is uh, Spiritual intelligence can be described as the adaptive use of spiritual information to facilitate everyday problem solving. Moses in the Bible was able to pass through the Red Sea and the rest. And then uh, Professor Abdul Latif mentioned about a verse in the early Quran about the people of the cave, how they were there for years and less and less. It's about transformation from time domain to frequency domain. So how do we make use of all this information to solve problems? That is what spiritual intelligence is all about. That is spiritual intelligence can be described as the ability of individual to behave with wisdom and compassion while maintaining in, inner and outer peace, regardless of your situation. And that's what we need at, at the age of 45 and, uh, and above. And then ability to utilize talent to know more, searching for meaning, analyzing existential, spiritual, and practical issues. So these are the, the, the four areas that, that we normally look at, inner knowing, deep intuition, oneness with nature. You can never, you can never innovate if you are not having oneness with nature, you are not not in your own skin. And then it's about problem solving. That's what, and then we have tried it everywhere. Yeah, based on your knowledge, your skill in spiritual intelligence, it leads to increase in innovation and creativity, and you can, and then success in business and less. So the most important thing is I, when you practice or learn more about spiritual intelligence, it, it increases your ability to tolerate others despite differences in belief and consciousness. Now to your question about yes, how, how can institution adopt or uh, infuse all these things. That's the main essence of CCMAS. Each university is to use the remaining 30% to put what is unique to them. Like all those seven skills that I mentioned in my previous presentation, we have the 30% gave us that opportunity to build it in. So I think it's about individual, it's about the management of those who are developing it to know that these are the main things that are unique to us. I think this mass has come at the right time. And I, give, I want to applaud Professor Kebukola for leading that. And then the NUCES also for championing it because it's about decolonization. It's about you and me addressing our local need, addressing what we need to do, addressing what we put us on that map, good map, and not about the, just memorizing velocity and acceleration. Like, just like the last week I also mentioned, uh, when we were taught in, in primary school, rainforest, tropical rainforest, Instead of them to tell us, to just tell us, that's, that's what tropical rainforest is all about. But they keep on telling us grammar and the rest that we cannot. So the whole idea is that, the whole idea is that we must not only talk about our uh, language, but we must recognize. Let's look at again. If you are very conversant with Lagos Ibadan Express Road, they will tell you, once you have a breakdown along the road, don't let those towing vehicles touch your car. Because once they touch your car, that car will never move until they tow it. Why? Because they have a wireless fuse that is connecting their, their hand to one fuse in your car. That is so, how do we talk about indigenous knowledge? How do we talk about... Uh, codification of our indigenous knowledge. That is about knowledge. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Yes, Chancellor. thanks a lot. I know we can continue forever. We were given till 12, 15. I will allow 
and with the, uh, apologies, Professor yes, just with apologies Professor to the uh, conference organizers, I will give one minute each to our other panelists to speak. Uh, I was going to ask them to share with us challenges, also to indicate the revolution uh, unfolding by Professor Kebukola and uh, uh, Baba Rashid, that is uh, Professor Rashid of NUC, and all of us on the CMAS. Uh, but I'll give one minute each with the approval of LSA host. Please, one minute each. We start with... Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. We start with uh, Dr. Funtade. We go to Professor Ladimeji. We so much thank you uh, for being with us. You're supposed to be in the here. And then also my dear friend, Dr. Bridget in Virginia. So one minute each, and I'll give a vote of thanks to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I want to talk about the CCMAS. I, I think it's a wonderful, I want to give uh, a praise and appreciation to Professor Okebula, uh, Okebukola and all the uh, team uh, at the NUC. But at the same time, look, the implementation of that CCMAS, the 30% you know, content from the university, that speaks exactly to the issue that I have with proper decolonization. How much of grassroots engagement you know, the universities have. Everything was done, there was so much pressure to be able to put all these things together. A limited conversation, and the conversation, who was it with? Where's the place of the industry, the marketplace, in what is going on, you know, with our curriculum, what, what, what we're learning in university. So I feel that theoretically, the new system has, should have uh, handled the, the colonization thing. But for me, effectively, it's just a lip service to decolonizing education curriculum because there is no proper engagement from grassroots that should generate all the way up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ladimeji, your closing remarks. Uh, I want to say that the issue of uh, challenges should be taken more seriously. How much of trust does the, an average parent has in a faith-based institution such as ours, such as Adeliki, such as you know, the one you have mentioned so far? Because you now come to realize that the federal establishment, federal universities are now talking of dress code, dress code, dress code, because they have also realized that because they neglected those aspects and put more emphasis on academics, the other aspect is now you know, you know, you know, negatively impacting on the, uh, the performance of the students. So how do we bring a whole, a complete child we don't need to only emphasize the academics, we should also emphasize the spiritual aspect. And that is what I think my university is out to do. Secondly, is the fact that today, when you look at the faith-based institutions such as ours, the average person want to believe that, no, what they go to do there is just to talk about evangelization alone. No, the issue goes beyond that. For instance, Alikma University has just graduated the first PhD in peace and security in the person of the new Inspector General of Police who defended his thesis in mid-May and by you know, October, November this year, he graduated at a Hikma University. Ditto with other medical uh, aspects of our courses. But the emphasis is that whatever you are able to acquire from the university, the aspect of learning with wisdom and morality should be atop of whatever you want to do. So that when you are an engineer, do that with the fear of God. When you're a medical doctor, do that with the fear of God. When you are a historian, do that with the fear of God. When you are an accountant, do that with the fear of God. It is only then that the, the, the products that are coming from this institution will be able to assist the government and ensure that we have a complete nation building. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bridget. It's so good to hear a lot of what is, you know, um, upcoming and developing in um, our educational space. I am also the founder and the CEO of um, Ed Conversations Niger. Now, I started this during the pandemic. And what was it? Just to be able to engage people to discuss the challenges that, you know, surround, our, you know, educational ecosystem. And it's so interesting that 
um, Dr. Kebukala was also is also from you know <laughs> from last. I'm week. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know, but I really I, I I appreciate you know the frustrations of our leadership not engaging with the community. It is a problem, and until we are able to identify and challenge, we need to be able to challenge the status quo challenge the CCMAX, ask for more involvement at, at the community level, because that is what faith and learning is all about. It is not just about morality. Morality has failed the society today. Morality has failed the generation of today. That is why I'm so interested. That's what got me interested in working with young people when I came to the US, because I saw that quite a number of our children schooling Nigerians, Africans, people from other, other, other nations, the challenges and the frustrations that they experience in the United States. That's what led me. I think that was the gravitating force to be involved in tertiary education because they are able to challenge you. They have the opportunity to ask questions. Let our students be open in Nigeria. Let us be able to say, look, now you brought this curriculum, you want us to engage 30 minutes, but how am I going to apply what this spiritual intelligence in the marketplace? How will it affect, how does it challenge me to think critically? How does it, if you do not change the person, the inner man of a man, of any woman, change the dressing, change the dress code, emphasize all the morality you want to, it will not make any change. It will not bring any change. That is why in a Liberty University, it's more about service learning. 20 hours every semester, you must identify a community, a problem that you have identified as an individual that has pricked your heart, that has challenged your, your status quo of thinking that, oh, I come from a secured family. I come from a secured environment, secured society. How do I go to Uganda? How do I go to Rwanda? And then how do I even go to California where there is fire outbreak? And what, how can I apply what I have learned in economics? What I have applied, what I have learned in in political science, what I have applied, what I've learned in science, what have I, I've learned in business in such situations. How can I make that environment that is suffering better? How can I encourage the next available homeless man that has his, his home is burnt, is burnt down? How do I empathize? That is changing the inner man. And that can only be done through faith. Thank it you. Is only faith in God that can make thank, that change. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. It is faith that has helped some of us uh, and uh, taken us to what we are, who we are today. Uh, by faith, we're able to excel. By faith, we have the audacity to do and exploit, to venture and to accomplish. And I think some of the questions in the Q&A uh, forum has been answered. Uh, what is the place of critical reasoning in faith-based curriculum and campus life? Uh, I think we've, uh, we've uh, the presenters, the panelists have uh, mentioned that. Uh, this conversation cannot end here. I think uh, I have to do a round table at my regular uh, uh, Wilson Global Leadership Series at Morgan State University when we start uh, another session. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you, both here present, uh, presenting, as well as uh, the, the panelists for finding time to share knowledge with us. Uh, the conversation will continue. I would like to thank the organizers of um, Legal Studies as uh, Association, uh, the the executive, the board, of which I'm one of them, <laughs> uh, the students, all the unknown, unknown, you know, uh, uh, 
people that are adding value to, to what LSA is about, what it has become. We want to thank you most sincerely. And also, we would like to thank our viewers on Facebook uh, Live. Uh, and thank you, Joby, on Facebook for this particular session. Uh, we'll be on Facebook for as long as uh, uh, we want to view it. And it will also be posted on YouTube for future. Uh, it has been a rewarding moment for me. I have learned when I started interrogating decolonization uh, for my doctoral degree uh, early in uh, 1989. I never thought I would look at the varieties. And then when I put this together, I did not know what this fantastic, distinguished you know, colleagues will present. Uh, I thank you most sincerely. Uh, as I stated, let us continue the, the talk, but let us put the talk into practice and let faith guide all that we do. I am yours truly, Akim Tijani. Goodbye and God bless all of you. Thank you so much. Someone, is, someone yes. is asking if you would be willing to share the slides with them. Which of this life for those who well they will get in touch with uh, yes. the first life. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's first yes. life. We will get with the we will get with the uh, organizer, particularly the president, after the panelists have reviewed, and then there is this caveat M talk of a kind of thing because it is their intellectual property. And then they will determine, make a decision to release it to LSA and then LSA will now share. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah.